Hello, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the lectionary Bible study in preparation for Sunday worship on November the 5th, All Saints Sunday, always a very special Sunday. This year for two reasons. First of all, All Saints, all the names of members of Emmanuel who have died this year will be read out loud. And secondly, it is the change of time. <laughs> Daylight savings time changes. So we have services all morning from 9, 10, 11, and 11.30. So if you sleep in and you miss the service you were planning on attending, don't worry, there'll be another service somewhere on our campus. Three great texts, very traditional texts for All Saints Day. Uh, Revelations chapter 7. 9 to 17, 1 John 3, 1 to 3, and the traditional reading for All Saints Day. Uh, in all churches that lift up this holiday, Matthew 5, 1 to 12, the Beatitudes. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, good and gracious God, we give you thanks for all those who have gone before us, who witness to the faith, who inspire us, those who have died this year, we remember with gratitude. Uh, bless us on this Sunday as we remember, as they continue to inspire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll start with uh, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, these great blesseds. And anytime we're reading the Beatitudes, we're seeing Jesus as the new Moses, and where Moses brought in the Ten Commandments, you should, you should, you should, thou shalt not this, and thou shalt not that. Here Jesus comes not with commandments, but with blessings, eight of them. And this is traditionally read at this All Saints service, basically saying that God has declared through Christ those who have died this year as blessed, not just the saints and the martyrs, but those who have died in our family and friends and in our church as well. The text, the blesseds, take place on a mountain in Galilee. Now, it probably wasn't a mountain. Luke calls it more of a hill. Uh, but Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is the new Moses coming down, again, not with the Ten Commandments, but with the Eight Blesseds. And it's in Galilee, which is important in this text. Galilee is not important religiously, right? Because Jerusalem was important religiously. That's where the temple is. Galilee is a backwater. It had been destroyed and inhabited by other exiles. The religion they practiced was not pure Judaism. And so it's not respected politically. It's not where the power was. It was not respected uh, religiously. That's not where the power was in the core. But it was a cultural center. A lot of trade took place there in the north in Galilee. And because there were all sorts of people coming in and out, again, all sorts of religions were practiced there again as well. And therefore, again, was not respected as a religious capital. So it's a backwater, it's on the periphery. And it's interesting that it's here where Jesus calls his disciples to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And we remember that today because that's where the Golan Heights are, right across from where Jesus gave these eight blesseds. A hot spot again in Israel as this is an area along with Gaza that is being contended. So here we have Jesus bringing these eight blessings. It's like honoring. Jesus is saying God honors these folks, these folks on the periphery, uh, those who have suffered, uh, those who seem to have nothing, those who are poor. Jesus is declaring honor, that God gives honor. It's interesting because Jesus in this text doesn't have wealth because that's often how you would bless someone was with wealth or inheritance or status. But in this text, Jesus is the broker of God's favor. And so we want to approach the text in that light. Jesus is offering God's favor on those who we would not normally see as having God's favor. And so I guess it raises the question, where would Jesus sit today 
and read off those blesseds. To whom would he read those blesseds? I mean, would he be in Wall Street? Would he be in Washington, D.C.? Or maybe we imagine him next to Mother Teresa in Calcutta? Or now with the war, would he be in Kiev declaring his blessings on those who are suffering in the war? Or would he be in Gaza declaring those people? Or in Jerusalem, or would he back, be back in Galilee declaring to those who have suffered violence his blessings? I think the text asks that question of us, where was Jesus now declaring his blessing? That's our first text. Who does Jesus declare to be saints on this All Saints Day? Second text takes a different view of sainthood, not just the blessings pronounced in the Beatitudes, but here we go from the beginning of the New Testament to the end, the book of Revelation, this final glorious appearing of the Lamb. It's between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seal, this uh, beautiful text in Revelation 7. And here, John, the seer, wonders who is gathered around the altar to praise the Lamb. There are so many people gathered in white robes uh, that he says, I can't count them. And you've got the angels all gathered around. There are some wonderful uh, artistic depictions of this scene as well as in our own sanctuary in one of the windows. And the seer says, now who are these? And we ask the same question. Who, who is gathered? Who are the saints who have been given these white robes who are blessing the Lamb? Now we got two answers to that and we'll want to be careful here because I think both answers, both options are correct. There's one those who are benefiting from the sacrificial system here in this text, they say that their robes have been washed in the blood of the lamb. And so we think about the Exodus, those who were liberated from Egypt and from the Pharaoh due to the angel of death passing over and putting the blood on the doorposts. Uh, we think about the sacrificial system that those would give up lambs and goats to be sacrificed and through that they were cleansed they were forgiven they were atoned so there is that sense in chapter 7 that these martyrs have been forgiven have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb that's one reading and yet all the texts in revelations is talking about the martyrs of the church about the bloodshed that rome had incurred in that area of the world and all over the world. Rome was brutal in exercising its reign. And so over and over again in Romans, we see in chapter 6, 6 verse 10, 16 verse 6, 17 verse 6, 18 verse 24, 19 verse 2, there's this complaint, how long, O Lord, will you allow Rome to brutalize us? and our people. How long, how long, O Lord? And so it's as if John is re reciting in a, in a secretive sort of way with this apocalyptic language, all the violence that is taking place. And he reminds us here also, and that's the second option. The first is the sacrificial system. The second is Rome was violent to our people, but Rome was violent to Jesus as well. So he talks about the blood of the lamb. It's talking about the brutality of how Jesus died, tortured on a cross. And so I think this encourages us to talk about redemption, about the end times, but also the saints who have experienced this type of brutality. We can remember the saints who are the innocent, really, who are suffering in Ukraine because of the war. We can remember those both Israeli Jews who died, according to, on the, by the hands of the Hamas. Innocent. And now we can watch the bombings in Gaza and see how many children and innocent adults, not members of Hamas, who are dying each and every day. We can remember those who have died through gun violence here in the United States, most recently in Maine. 
innocent kids, innocent adults. And there is the same cry that we pray each and every time these types of massacres show up in our TV screens. How long, O oh Lord? And so I think Revelation acknowledges that and says that this suffering is finally redemptive and those who were innocent who died as saints now gather around the throne and give glory to the Lamb. Finally, 1 John, a third vision of sainthood. Uh, here we have two types of change. Uh, the first in 1 John recognizes that when we are loved by Jesus, we change. And he acknowledges that in the text. We've all been changed by the love of Jesus. And then, though, he says, but it wasn't complete, the change. Because finally, we will ultimately change to perfection when Jesus comes again and we see him, the text says, as he is. And when we see uh, uh, the Lord, we change completely. So he will appear in the end times and we shall see him as he is and shall, we will then at that point be like him. We will be saints. Now, it does use different language for us than Jesus. Jesus is called God's son, and we are called God's children. So there is some distinction there, but it's a beautiful beatific vision of how we will all become saints in the end. So here, these are three wonderful texts that lift up sainthood in different ways. Again, Matthew 5, declaring the saints, all of us blessed. Uh, Revelation 7, this end time vision of those who, who have suffered. And 1 John 3, at the end times, we will see Jesus as he is and we will be transformed into being saints. I hope these reflections are helpful as you prepare for worship this upcoming Sunday, All Saints Day. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye now.